Hello, everyone from New York City. Uh, we are attempting a bit of a technological miracle here, so please bear with us. Uh, I'm very happy to be joined by Juan Guaido, who's somebody who knows a lot about the struggle for democracy against repressive regimes. Uh, he is president of the Venezuelan National Assembly and has been recognized by more than 50 countries including the United States and several EU nations as Venezuela's rightful leader. So I'd like to begin by asking you um, this. Uh, after the massive protests of 2019, with hundreds of thousands of people in the streets, demonstrations that moved the world, it appears that your movement against President Maduro has lost momentum. Would you say that's true? And if so, what's the reason for that? Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much for the invitation. Of events like this are very important for the fight for democracy, for the fight for democracy in Venezuela, for democracy throughout the world. And very important for recognition, which is necessary at this particular point in time. It's important for there to be understanding of what the situation is, what the situation is, and what what the fight for democracy, for human rights, actually entails. Because justice, of course, and achieving justice is no simple fact. It's not something to be taken as a given. We have we find ourselves in a very difficult situation in the world today. The context is extremely complex. Now. Uh, let us say that, first of all, uh, there, the Maduro regime is recognized by certain entities, international entities, by the United Nations as well. This is a criminal regime, essentially. And uh, as you understand, it is important for us to fight in an extremely, very, in a very, very complex situation. The context, once again, is extremely difficult. Uh, changes are taking place in the world throughout, but we find ourselves in a certain quagmire right now. So it is extremely important for us to work in a, an environment, a context of aggression, a, a context which is one where violation of human rights is rampant. So uh, uh, this is something that, of course, concerns not only the people of Venezuela, principally the people of Venezuela, but the entire international community as well. The people of Venezuela have been victims of this uh, regime. Uh, it's also for reasons of very, very fundamental reasons of dem protection of human rights, fighting for and bolstering democracy. That's why it's extremely important to continue this particular struggle. And indeed, it is, once again, in a very difficult environment that we are struggling. I understand that. Uh, it, it did seem last year, really, that the Maduro regime was teetering on the brink of falling. And we've seen this quite a lot around the world. Massive movements. We were just hearing Nathan Law in Hong Kong. Massive protests. And yet, when it, when it comes to really breaking through uh, and actually toppling the man you call a usurper, um, it doesn't quite happen. Um, did you feel, uh, w why do you think that is? Did you feel at a certain point that a mistake was made or that uh, he was somehow able to rally support? You approached the military, you tried to rally the military to your side, that didn't seem to work. Why, isn't, why is it you couldn't clinch the deal? I think we all recognize what a terrible, repressive, corrupt uh, regime you're up against. Indeed, a United Nations human rights panel just last month uh, found Maduro and other leaders of his government uh, give, guilty of crimes against humanity, killings, torture, sexual violence. I think the world knows this, but why can't you clinch the deal? Well, 
para the new is different variables in Venezuela. Uh, if they're able to import to uh, establish the foundations of democracy in the country. And I think, first of all, we have to understand that we're living in a brutal re regime where there's violation of human rights, uh, where uh, criminals, uh, criminals are essentially violating very, very fundamental human rights. So uh, you made reference to the major movements this year and last year. Uh, I'd also like to add to that the fight that's taking place in Belarus right now to that entire list. So in other words, masses of fighting against uh, authoritarian regimes. Um, yeah. And that's what's taking place in uh, Venezuela as well. 90% uh, 90 90 of the country rejects Nicolas Maduro. They see him as a dictator. They see the regime as an authoritarian regime. And um, uh, as what's taking place is a kind of violation of fundamental human rights, uh, crime against humanity, for them all. So uh, now, of course, uh, the armed forces, you mentioned them, they spiral around, of course, Maduro. They are linked to drug trafficking. They're linked to terrorist activities themselves as well. Uh, indeed, uh, it's not the single individual. It is this conglomeration, if you like, uh, Maduro and the armed forces. But we have to uh, consider we have to continue we have to continue our fight as well trying to uh, convince trying to somehow win the minds the hearts and minds of the armed forces as well that it's absolutely necessary for them to participate in the process in order to, in order to achieve democracy and stability in the country and, and of course all sectors of society and all layers have to be included in this as well now, uh, right now, there are uh, there are a number of different external factors as well, uh, entities that have exchanged, that have some sort of contact with the Maduro regime and provide support. Uh, these parties are complicit in a violation and a human rights violation as well. So, uh, indeed, once again, this very, very complex situation has led to great instability in the region, uh, controversies developing, conflicts of different sorts between various different entities, so complex that it really blows the mind, essentially. And uh, perhaps this entire web of situations is one that uh, leads to these individuals remaining in power, these totalitarian figures staying where they are, entrenched. So, uh, I think what we have to do is we have to mobilize. We have to mobilize not only domestically, but internationally as well. And once again, bring all the layers of society into the game, uh, be that uh, social layers or, of course, the armed forces in this instance as well. Uh, uh, because what we're speaking about is a fight against a criminal uh, who is responsible for crimes against humanity. Um, there seems to be a split, a growing split between the European Union and the United States. And you seem perhaps to be uh, skeptical of the EU's latest moves. Um, the, the EU sent a, a mission uh, to Caracas recently and is trying to, as far as I understand it, is trying to salvage um, the legislative elections scheduled for December, which you have dismissed as a fraud uh, and you seem to have dismissed this mission too, saying that if, if the election is delayed, a delayed election is, is still a fraud. So your position seems to be no, no, no to these legislative elections, even if the EU thinks it can make them happen and that might be a good way to secure a transition. Meanwhile, the Trump administration, in the person of Elliot Abrams, has dismissed what the EU is doing as cowboy diplomacy, cowboy diplomacy, which seems a bit rich on the face of it from the Trump administration. So in this apparent spat between the EU and the United States over what to do about these legislative elections, who do you side with? Are you in fact siding with the Trump administration and dismissing Europe's efforts or not? Now, the, 
the solution, the solution to the crisis, of course, in Venezuela is linked to presidential elections and parliamentary elections. Uh, we, have, we have established five particular conditions for these elections to take place in an effective fashion. What we want is for uh, real elections to take place and not sort of legitimization, if you like, of a dictatorship. Uh, so, uh, uh, if these elections are to be manipulated for that particular purpose, then uh, it's ineffective and uh, there would be no sense in that. Uh, uh, I think it's quite clear that there isn't that popular support there for the Maduro regime. We want no prisoners, uh, political prisoners, we want no torture, we want none of these types of human rights violations that are taking place. We want uh, also indeed for there to be arbitration, if necessary, an arbitrator in other words, and an electoral commission which functions in an effective fashion. Uh, these are some of the conditions that are necessary in order for proper parliamentary elections to take place and uh, of course uh, following from that presidential elections as well. But we find but um, I think, indeed, we do feel that uh, an approach has to be very, very delicate indeed. There has to be understanding that uh, the elections fine, but elections have to take place under specific conditions. And I do feel that that is something that has to be understood uh, by the European Union. Uh, right now, I think it's very important also to emphasize the fact that we have to have legalized political parties. We can't have elections with uh, uh, the limitations as far as which political parties can participate. And, um, and once again, we have to understand that these elections will be taking place in a situation where right now we have a dictatorship. We have to orient the, the vote, if you like, or uh, there has to be an arbitrator, there has to be uh, observation, election observation, those types of missions have to be in place. And um, uh, this is where we have uh, the various views that are presented either by the Organization of American States, the United States, or the European Union. I think, indeed, there has to be an understanding that for democracy to take, to exist, for those necessary steps towards democracy to be conducted in an effective fashion, that we have to have a proper uh, communication, we have to have the proper conditions in place for elections to take place in a democratic fashion. Uh, and I think it's very, very careful to not convert these elections into some sort of legitimate process for uh, the regime that's in place. And indeed, the Organization of American States has a very important role to play. Uh, we're all here, we're all ready to do all of the necessary steps and to take the necessary, to adopt the necessary conditions, except for the regime, in order for those elections to take place. But I think, once again, these conditions uh, these conditions have to exist. Once again, we don't want to legitimize through pseudo-elections uh, something uh, that is unacceptable, in other words, the authoritarian regime. And I think, indeed, those five particular conditions that we've made quite clear have to be adhered to, and they have to be met for elections to take place effectively. Thank you. Do you, do you think, sir, that the EU mission was useful? And clearly, the uh, Josep Borrell, the foreign policy chief of the EU, believes. I think once, once again, if those five conditions are met, and if the EU is along those particular lines working together with us, then we will be able to take those necessary first steps towards democracy through legitimate elections. Uh, I think it's quite clear. We have the examples from 2019. We have the other examples of the past of how elections can be hijacked. So, uh, once again, uh, uh, let's make it quite clear that the intention for dialogue on the part of the government doesn't exist right now. Doesn't exist right now. So, uh, I do feel that uh, the necessary steps have to be made for us to be able to achieve, as I mentioned earlier, on this type of uh, situation. And all have to play an effective role, be it the U European Union, be it the Organization of American States, the United States, all have to work together in this particular direction, in this struggle. And I do feel that right now everybody is moving in the right direction towards establishing a system for legitimate elections. Good. Uh, what did you make of uh, President Maduro's 
apparent softening the his decision to release more than a hundred, I think, opposition politicians. He's made various apparently conciliatory gestures. Um, do you think the leopard is changing his spots? Well, Maduro, since 2018, uh, there uh, have been steps that have been made, but let's not forget that we have the political prisoners at the same time, and um, they still continue to exist, irrespective of the fact that certain individuals have been released. Uh, and and uh, indeed, in, in many continue to exist, hundreds continue to exist at this particular point in time. Individuals for them have been tortured. Uh, uh, and we do have indeed testimonies, very, very veritable testimonies that, these, that this particular type of torture is taking place. Uh, a number of fact-finding missions have taken place. Um, and, uh, this is something that has been recognized uh, and known. Uh, but, uh, there have been individuals released, but there are more than 300 uh, such detentions, such prisoners at the, at the present moment in time. So I think indeed the struggle for democracy has to make it like quite clear. One of the conditions that all political prisoners be released, not just a handful, all have to be released. Uh, but the strategy that's been adopted by the Maduro government is something which is not totally unfamiliar. A number of other regimes have uh, made these types of de gestures, a kind of simulacrum, if you like, of, uh, of softening more than anything else. So. I think, indeed, uh, we have to uh, adhere to those conditions that have been mentioned earlier on, that if we want a process of democracy, a process, of, an electoral process, which will lead to true democracy, uh, for a political and social solution for the entire country, that all conditions have to be met, and one of those conditions, of course, will be the release of all political prisoners. You've been very strongly supported by President Trump and by the Trump administration. Um, I'm sure you watched the debate between President Trump and um, Joe Biden, Democratic candidate. In it, my president uh, dismissed the forthcoming November 3 elections in the United States as a fraud, as rigged. Um, he said that he suggested with no evidence that a lot of the mail-in ballots were fraudulent he said that the result may well have to go to the Supreme Court, which, of course, as we speak, is moving in an even more conservative direction. Uh, given his dismissal of America's own election and uh, his apparent disrespect for American democracy, uh, how much faith do you personally place uh, in President Trump's strong advocacy of democracy in your country. Well, now, I, I think, as you know, the fight for democracy in our country has been very, very firm and concerted and uh, with a character of determination as well, and uh, at a number of different levels, uh, a number of different levels. Uh, we've been working. And uh, now we have also been working together with the different, uh, 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 with the Trump administration, also with Congress, with Congress, with the two houses of Congress, with the House of Representatives and the Senate as well. Uh, we've been trying to deliver the message about the situation in Venezuela and the need for support as well. And, uh, and uh, issues such as freedom of expression, different fundamental human rights. Uh, uh, of course, all of this is part of um, uh, a democracy, a democracy with all the trimmings. And uh, I think, indeed, it's simply important to strengthen participation for people to understand uh, in both continents, North and South America, the importance of uh, these particular very, very important fundamentals. Let's not forget that we live in a dictatorship right now. 
uh, and uh, of course in the United States it's a totally different situation there will be uh, participation there are, uh, parties are free to participate and um, and of course there is full respect and support for the institutions that exist in the United States uh, whereas as far as the kind of rotting structures that we have in Venezuela where there's very very little support or very little respect for those uh, that we have here very very difficult to draw any comparison whatsoever of course but and also that the role of citizens, the role of citizens in the power process, uh, that the kind of cornerstone, if you like, of democracy, uh, that is something which totally is non-existent simply here, whereas in the United States one couldn't say the same. You are a passionate fighter for democracy and your fight has moved a lot of people. As you look around the world, is there a beacon of democracy for you? A, an idea or a country that inspires you particularly? Well, there are, of course, there are, of course, numerous different types of regimes, and there are those types of regimes that hold in their clutches uh, the populace, the, the entire population of a country. Uh, and, of course, those regimes are ones where there is no respect for human rights whatsoever, where fundamental liberties are curtailed, and where that fundamental respect for citizens simply does not exist. And, um, and we see this, these types of regimes, uh, these types of regimes go hand in hand with a crumbling uh, institutions as well. Uh, and uh, we have numerous different examples. We have, you can see situations which are similar to the situation that we have here in Venezuela. We have, for example, what's going on in Nicaragua right now as well. But I think it's very important to understand and for citizens to understand their rights, that the necessity to respect their rights. And um, I think indeed we have numerous different, uh, very sad examples in the, wor in the world. I don't know what the good example would be, but the sad examples indeed, Belarus, uh, Nicaragua, uh, struggles against dictatorships, which are very much part of our times and uh, something that people encounter uh, through the media on a daily basis right now. So I think indeed uh, one has to understand the, the nature of these particular regimes, the terrible suffering of individuals that are, sm that are smothered by these particular regimes, and also uh, I think it's a very important to uh, underline the the need for struggle against these regimes and not take into consideration any sort of commercial gains that might exist by using these regimes or in using them as implements for some other purpose. The main thing is liberty, the liberty, the freedom of human beings and for people to be able to live in a democratic society. How do you explain the resurgence of nationalism and authoritarianism around the world. I mean, if in 1990, at the fall of the Berlin Wall, the communism, the disappearance of the Soviet Union, someone had suggested that 30 years later, somebody like Vladimir Putin could dismiss liberalism as finished, uh, they would have said you were crazy. And yet we see around the world this resurgence of authoritarian or repressive, nationalistic, slogan of the President of the United States is America first uh, uh, ideas. How do you explain that? Um, we would explain it simply with an example, the example that we have right here. Uh, uh, a country uh, where there was some sort of structure in place, where there's natural resources, there's wealth, there is and uh, the undermining of uh, the various uh, positive aspects of the society and of the structure with an authoritarian, if you like, uh, poison. Uh, so 
I think here we've seen a wonderful example of a mixture of populism, the undermining of institutions, and uh, and indeed, um, uh, there are numerous different factors in our world today which have exacerbated the situation. Perhaps uh, the flow of information, the speed of transfer of misinformation or non-information, if you like, as well. Maybe that plays some role as well. But I think indeed uh, a wonderful example is what has happened here. Uh, with the undermining of democratic institutions uh, and different populist messages which have been delivered as well. In a state under the rule of law, it has to be understood, first of all, that rule of law is the key to everything, that that is something without which we cannot we simply cannot live, and that the necessary conditions have to exist for rule of law to prevail. And indeed, I think indeed right now, Democrats, democratic-minded individuals rather, have to really listen very, very carefully, gauge the situation, understand what the needs of uh, the populace are, what the demands of people are, what the, the finer points of the defending of human rights, what that entails, and Democrats have to, democratic-minded, rather, individuals throughout the world, have to fight for those principles and understand that they are indeed under threat. And I think, indeed, these very, very fundamental values have to be disseminated, they have to be bolstered, they have to be defended uh, against against totalitarian tendencies or totalitarian undercurrents uh, wherever they may exist. But I, once again, I do feel that here we have a wonderful example of that deterioration that you mentioned in the world. And indeed, our struggle is out but, there for us. But uh, you know, when, you, when you think about the, the factors that have allowed nationalist authoritarians to thrive, um, you know, is it growing inequality in our societies? Is it the perceived impunity of the rich? Uh, is it the impact uh, of the internet? Is it the feeling among many people in many societies, democratic societies that they're marginalized? Uh, is it immigration? Um, I mean, these figures emerge uh, because they respond to certain forces uh, and feelings in society. Um, and democracies sometimes appear weaker as a result. Uh, look at Hungary, look at Poland, um, look at many countries around the world, look at what's been happening in Brazil. Um, is there any one factor that you would point to? Uh, as I said, you're a fighter for democracy. If you were speaking from some platform to all, but like this one, to all the Democrats of the world, what would you say we must do uh, to safeguard this very, very precious thing, which is our freedom and our democracies? I think democracy has to be given a voice. It has to be given a voice, and there has to be empowerment, empowerment as well of all people, so that they can be part of the process. It also has to do with the legal systems, with justice as well, that rule of law exists, that a legislative framework exists that's implemented as well. And also the issue of legitimacy as well. It has to be understood that legitimacy is absolutely key for democracy to exist. And citizens must understand that this is something that is absolutely imperative for uh, liberty to exist.
Perhaps we're speaking about the usurping of power by a minority of individuals through manipulation, through misinformation as well. So, once again, we have examples of that around us. Nicaragua, for example, and indeed participation, participation of the public, of the public is absolutely important. Tolerance as well, understanding and tolerance. This is something which will be taken into consideration as well. So some very, very fundamental, if you like, emotion. Uh, and then we have certain phenomena of our time, migration. Uh, and, and I think indeed many of these different problems that we encounter right now, day, right now can be overcome through strengthening the institutions that are there, strengthening the institutions but above all making citizens be part of the entire process. Because that participatory element is fa it has failed to a certain extent. We don't see people involved. And I think indeed these are some of the issues that are taken into consideration. We're running out of time, but but very quickly, sir. When when will we see a democratic Venezuela? Next year, year after? Well, we see democracy right now in Venezuela, but it's democracy of the people that they've expressed themselves very, very clearly about what they want. And hopefully this will materialize into some sort of governmental structure that will reflect in it. But the democracy that exists right now is, the, is in the voice of these individuals that are they're struggling for democracy. That is the voice of democracy. And unfortunately, right now we're a dictatorship, but when and if we have parliamentary elections, presidential elections, uh, capacitating the public, in other words, elections that will take place, uh, respecting the various conditions that have been set down, at that point, we will emerge from this particular tragedy, and we will find ourselves in a situation of uh, on the path to democracy. People now, however, are expressing the spirit, the philosophy of democracy, demanding for their rights, demanding for human rights. And indeed, democracy, the fight for democracy hasn't lost its momentum, it's moving forward quickly, and our job is to, uh, to uh, escort that particular process and to allow for it to take place. So we want to express, we are expressing the will of the people out there that are crying out for democracy and for respect of human rights and crying out against the criminal regime that is in power right now in Venezuela. So democracy will come from that grassroots level, if you like. It won't come from above. And once again, I'd like to thank you very much for this opportunity, and I'd like to extend a hand of friendship and embrace as well to all those who are fighting for democracy in the world. I think indeed that determination is fundamental. Uh, we need mechanisms, de democratic mechanisms in place fighting against authoritarian, dictatorial regimes. Uh, and I'm sure that there, we will be successful here in Venezuela, tomorrow in Belarus, in Cuba, in Nicaragua, and wherever else these types of authoritarian regimes exist. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you.